Richard Listen Show. We are live in studio at the Hollywood Production Center. And tonight is an exciting night for me. I have an esteemed uh, basketball coach guest who's going to talk to us about all things from chasing toddlers to, am I looking at the wrong camera? To looking at the right camera, apparently. Um, to how to work with today's modern day athlete. Uh, we're going to get into the challenges of going from mm -hmm. the underdog to being uh, a team that people are gunning for. Uh, as always, a reminder, thank you to my listeners. Thank you for following us on Instagram, Richard Listens, Facebook, Richard Listens. And as the coach is encouraging me to get my Twitter game, my, t my tweets up. Yeah. So uh, we'll be working on my percentage uh, off camera. Uh, it's been an exciting couple weeks. I just came back from Arizona. Thanks so much to uh, Mark Goldberg, TV producer for the Phoenix Suns and Mercury, uh, and to their COO over there for hosting us and giving us a tour of that facility. What a piece of uh, basketball lore and history. And uh, for getting to see that the, the locker rooms are, are way too small. I think probably Windwards have got a, a leg <laughs> up, I hope. I hope. I mean, um, so, um, but it's pretty cool to, to see your, your childhood uh, teams that you watched growing up and um, to get a Tom Chambers bobblehead after all. Very nice. Yes. So, um, and got to catch Chase Field, um, uh, baseball park, uh, 30th out of 30 on the cost index for a family of four. So they make it fam friendly. They use visual, uh, virtual reality nice. to work your uh, swing. So we can uh, talk cool. about maybe uh, if coach has been using that with any of his players on the basketball realm. But without further ado, enough about me and my travels around. Um, uh, today we have with us a D1 coach for, do we call it the Winward? School, Win 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 Windward, Windward, Windward School, school. Yeah. Windward School. Uh, his journey has taken him from Cal State Fullerton up to the University of Portland, and now back here to Los Angeles. And without further ado, uh, he is also a coach for Team USA, and he's been building this program to a point where they had 26 wins last season. 25. 25, 25 66 yeah. overall in three years. Yes. Y yes. I'm getting closer. So, yes. I'm getting yeah. closer. Um, and um, without further ado, in studio today, Coach Colin Foth, thank, thank you. you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm yeah. excited about it, yeah. <laughs> so uh, today we're going to get into uh, working with the modern-day athlete, uh, what it's like to coach in, uh, in this city of Los Angeles yep. here, and, and, and a little bit about your journey. Um, where should we begin? You guys had a, a tournament earlier this summer. Uh, now you're on the map. Yeah. So should we say? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So basically, it's been a it's been a really interesting year, I think, for the prep level because the recruiting calendar changed. There was a, there was some reform at the NCAA level with in terms of recruiting. So what it allowed the high school and the scholastic schools to do was to participate in an event. Um, in June, where college coaches could come and watch, which typically had been reserved for the AU and the club level. So in July, Division One coaches, Division Two, II, Division Three, all those schools could go and watch players with their club team and all these different events across the country. It was basically 15 days or so where you were just out watching games all day. Well, um, the NCAA came up with this uh, this new calendar where they said, "Hey, we're going to now reserve two weekends in June." where the college coaches can go and watch with your high school team. Then it became a little tricky where some states were going to participate, some states were not. So anyway... Does uh, so that tie into all the fairness rules and things like that? or Yes, some, some liability and insurance and who's going to be hosting. and um, it, it was a lot of layers, a lot, you know, a lot of layers to it. So anyway, so Arizona, um, they, uh, they kind of spearheaded the charge and they put together this thing called Section 7, which is Section 7 tournament. Section 7, the... The West Coast is divided into sections. So Arizona, Section 7, and kind of that lower region on the West Coast. So um, his goal, uh, a guy by the name of Matt King, was to basically invite kind of the top, you know, top the top 30 caliber teams from each region on the West Coast in Section 7. Uh, so, you know, fortunate for us, we were invited, and uh, we drove out to Arizona. And it was a really high-level tournament. I think there were 16 teams and about eight or nine brackets. And so we were playing in the second highest bracket. Um, so it was really exciting because obviously the college coaches are there. They're all high level competitive games with your high school, which, you know, again, has, hasn't been done before. 
So um, as we went throughout the weekend, we had a great first game against uh, last year at Camp Lindo High School who won the state title in Division Two, And it was a great game. We won that game. It was a Friday night. It was late. A lot of coaches in the gym. And again, it's great for recruitment and, and all that stuff. Uh, Saturday morning, we ended up playing the host school, which was Brophy Prep, um, in their main gym, which beautiful facilities. And uh, so we got that win. And then that night, we were playing a school called uh, Eastside Catholic from Seattle, who's really, really good. And uh, again, a lot of coaches, because you know it's kind of a marquee game at a marquee time, and they have a lot of kids that are being recruited. And um, we played probably the best first half of basketball I can remember since I've been the coach at Windward. And we were up, you know, I think it was like 18 points at halftime. And I'm like, this, this is unbelievable. Next thing I know, we're down two with about two minutes to go. So the momentum had totally shifted and all this. And, and we came out with the win, you know, in the last, last 30 seconds or so. And so the guys were pumped up and they're exhausted mentally, physically, you know. Um, so we got them in the ice bath. Got them all stocked up and hydrated and, and whatnot. And then we played for the championship against a, st- a school called Coronado from Las Vegas. And they have some nationally ranked players, some Team USA players. Um, and that game was probably in front of, I'd say, anywhere from 200 to 350 coaches. Wow. Coaches all the way from Texas, you know, uh, to UC Irvine. So uh, the, the range was really broad, and, and our guys performed, and we ended up competing and, and, and beat that team, which, you know, we're certainly the underdog for that game. So it was a great way to kind of cap the summer. Um, I think it kind of put our program on the map from a national perspective and then also got our guys just, it was a great platform for them to be seen and exposed to all the college coaches. How did you balance that as a coach, um, helping them prepare for meeting with coaches and that extra degree of pressure but excitement uh, yeah. with also meeting the new expectations of playing tougher competition? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, the nice thing is, for most of these guys, because they've been doing it at the club level, you know, for a couple of years, playing in front of college coaches wasn't that new to most of them. Um, so I think they were kind of ready to handle that already. Um, you know, and the, and the competition thing, I mean, that's what's fun about it, right? And I think our guys have really taken pride in kind of being this small school on the west side of L.A. and, and having that pride that we can compete with anyone. So last year we had to go to Long Beach Poly. Um, the second round of playoffs, the CIF, and you know, playing a Long Beach Poly, you know, can be intimidating for for a lot of people. Um, but we did that and came out with a win. So I think you know that was kind of like the foundation. Battle right tested there. a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and our guys love you know, like most competitors, they just love stepping up to the challenge and like you know, trying to compete at the highest level. So I think they were, I think they they were ready. You know, I don't know if there's anything I actually did, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, we were talking, we were joking off camera that the in speaking with. Some of the players, the, the the fact that most of them have been playing since they're four or five, and competitively, it sounded yeah. like most from eight to ten, sounds like their condition uh, to play in really, really constant competitive yeah. environments. Uh, they don't seem to get phased by that. Yeah. No, you know, I think there's moments, right? Like there's moments you're at the free throw line, it's a big game, maybe you're on the road, but I mean, gosh, these guys, especially now with like. You know, sports specification kind of being the thing, right? When we were coming up, it was you played basketball, you played you played football in the fall, you played basketball in the winter, and then you did baseball in the spring. And and now it's just really not like that. We've got, I think we have right now. No snow football for you? <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> so, you know, we have like two or three multi-sport athletes, which is phenomenal, you know, for them and for us. I mean, I, I think it's great. But these guys have been just been playing basketball for so long, specifically basketball, you know. So they're just, you know. Yeah, they're just conditioned at this point. Yeah, so so in speaking to that, so in this new culture of of athlete that's focused, that's specified, that sets their vision on the next level, uh, what unique challenges does that present you as a coach? Uh, and, and how do you address them differently maybe than you would <clears throat> with people who aren't thinking so far ahead? Sure. Yeah, I think it's... You know, one of the things we do in our program is we tell the guys, hey, we're going to coach all of you differently, right? And I kind of compare it to, like, parenting. Like, my parents did not raise me the same as I raised my sister, my older brother, right? And so we do the same thing, and we, and we tell them that. And we tell their parents, hey, we're going to coach each of you guys differently. You guys all need different things. Um, and so with that, I mean, some of, those, some of the kids, some of the parents put a lot of pressure on themselves, right, in their situations as it pertains to basketball or competing or athletics or performance or results, you know? 
And so what we try to do is just is really try to give offer like a different perspective and kind of remind them that like it's okay to fail. You know, we're, we're failing to get better, right? And we're still going to support you. We're going to do, you know, we're going to do whatever we can on our end to get you to where you want to go, um, collectively and individually, right? Um, and I think a lot of that is it's sometimes it's hard conversations with parents too, because they're you know, you know, all they're really seeing is their kid versus the big picture, whether it's collective holes, the team, and the long term stuff, right? And so they're so like every possession, every shot, they're there's like this, you know, and we're like relax, right? And I, I told a player a couple weeks ago, he was he was in a bit of a shooting slump, and I said, I said, dude, like, think about this. You're going to shoot, let's say, 10 million shots, probably way more, in your life, right? So if you just drew a line, right, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, a million, and you start going that line, and if in between 100,000 shots and 125,000 dollar shots, your percentage dropped a little bit, just for that, just for that little portion on the line, but then it goes up, and it, it's gonna do this. But it's gonna do this overall when, when you get to that last, that final number, right? So if you think about it like that, like of course you're gonna have some, you know, some some peaks and valleys. But like, stay the course, stay confident. You're a great shooter. Shoot your shots. You know, do what you do. Not to react to recency. You know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so <clears throat> that's kind of been a big thing for us. And luckily, you know, I'm on campus a lot, and um, my staff, who's unbelievable, uh, two young guys that really 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 are passionate about coaching and helping young guys they're great so they give them kind of that you know that that other perspective you know and then i have an older uh, gentleman named uh, john elliott who's been coaching around la high school basketball forever and so he kind of has that perspective like man and he'll, he'll always compare him to a, a guy who you know has already been through la hoops and maybe he's retired out of the nba or like maybe he's in the nba now and so he has he, a long vision yeah of he'll always have a story like man i remember when this guy you know went through a slump and you know, so I think it's just kind of that we have a good balance as a staff, and I think we're able to connect that to the kids, whether it's you know, a, if it's a fit like a, a skill issue or if it's you know a mental issue. Did, did you get to choose your staff? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Handpicked. Handpicked. <laughs> that sounds like a good balance. So, so as far as your journey uh, going from, we're talking about the uniqueness of going from college all the way to having having players at Fullerton that you able to help them reach the peak of yep. professional basketball was it the NBA or just uh, a lot of overseas a couple guys like you know 10 day contract here in the NBA that sort of thing yeah so so and and being a new coach at that point right uh, yep. and getting people to that level uh, and then going to university level what's that like to go to be a D1 coach um you know the highest level in the country uh in portland right which pacific northwest is fiercely athletic and competitive mm -hmm. a lot of good schools up there um so first of all what's it like to make that jump um getting that big job um and how did you how did you make that transition yeah it's it's pretty interesting i mean just to kind of backtrack a minute when i first got done playing i coached at the high school level for a year i was a jv coach varsity assistant then jump to the JC level, so yeah. California Community Thanks College. Thanks for helping level. me start in the beginning. Yeah, thank you, yeah, thank no you, problem, Coach. No problem. <laughs> but uh, that actually gave me such a good foundation for coaching because at the junior college level, you learn to do everything. There's no budget, then there's only two of you, right? I mean, it's not like they have all this money to pay staff and a film guy and this. I mean, so you're the manager. Literally learn you're the... to do everything, whether it's travel and uh, study hall, helping kids with you know apply for financial aid. I mean, you're doing everything, and you're coaching, and you're recruiting. So when you get to the Division One level, all that stuff, that focus gets narrowed, right? Player development, scouting, and recruiting. So I went from a job where I was doing everything from sweeping the floors to making sure the, the camera was on, right, during practice, to running down, running a station, stat, you know, all this stuff, and it, it just really gave me a great, um, a great foundation then when I got to the Division One level, I actually had less responsibility in a way, and I was like, "Oh, this is it's pretty good." <laughs> you know, yeah, this is turn over the assistant. Yeah, this, How many fouls he got? <laughs> yeah, this is a little easier. So, um, so I made that jump, and I, I, you know, I got a, a job at Cal State Fullerton where I made no dollars, literally zero money. Um, it was a volunteer spot, um, and I was there for two years, and so I was just, you know, I was, I was passionate about it. I fell in love with it, and then an opportunity uh, popped open at the University of Portland. 
and I was so, able to you, get on But you were there. focused when you went to Fullerton on coaching. You oh, I was, you yeah. For a coach. So I was on staff. It just, they didn't, you know, at that time, they didn't have, a lot of times, they didn't have a paid position, you know. And, 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 and back in Division One, there was only usually two full-time assistant spots that were paid. That third assistant spot used to be called a volunteer spot. So you didn't make money, which, you know, would be challenging as, as just to survive in the business, you know. So um, by the time I got to Portland, you know, I had all these different experiences and worked for different people and... Um, so I felt like I had a pretty good uh, foundation going in, and then Portland kind of opened my eyes to just uh, another, a whole other side to the game um, from an analytic standpoint, from kind of a uh, administrative standpoint, um, from a marketing standpoint. And so I was there for six years, and you know had had a, had a great great run up there. And then when this opportunity came open, you know again, I mean. This was a competitive job. I mean, who doesn't want to work at a private independent school in West LA? You know, with great athletes, great history, a great campus. I mean, it's you know, I'm every day I go there. I joke with the guys. I mean, I would say, hey, what'd you guys have for lunch today? Because it's Taco Tuesday, it's sushi on Wednesday. I mean, it's you know, it's it's unbelievable. So um, when I got here, I, I felt like I mean, I was just I was ready. I was prepared. I had seen, you know, I'd swept the floors, and then I also had flown to the Canary Islands to go play in a tournament in Spain where, you know, we're not paying a dollar out of our own pocket. So I'd experienced kind of both the Spectrum ends. of basketball. Yeah, now. absolutely. And um, and when I got here, I just, you know, every day I, I love it here because the guys love it. They're passionate about it. Um, the school supports it. Um, we got a great facility. We got great kids. We have, and, and I work with great people. So every day it's, you know, it's it's great. So there was no part of going from the collegiate level back to high school that felt like um, like a step down. Yeah, like a step down or a challenge in that, like you wanted to maintain. Yeah, no, it's a good question. You know, for me, here's here's when I started coaching. I always said I want to coach at a place that I can enjoy living in and make enough money to do so. That's all I cared about. I never said Division One. I, I never said NBA. I never said college. You know, I just wanted to be in a place that I could enjoy living and coach and make enough money to hopefully do it, right? I mean, that's that's the whole right. thing too. But so for me, it wasn't ever about level, you know? And my last year, my last two years in Portland is kind of when I started going through like, hey, is this what I want to do? As an assistant, your job and your role is so much different than as being the head guy, right? So every decision I make now impacts the program at Windward. When I was at University of Portland, my boss, the head coach, would probably take... 25% of my input, right? And maybe back on the game or sure, or in, implement it and execute it. So, my thumbprint on the program there is a lot less. And I think, as anyone as competitors, as someone who's involved in coaching, I mean, you want to have as much as of your thumbprint on the program and on the on the day to day as possible. So, the division one level, there's some assistants that have a ton of that, or some assistants that don't have much. Um, you know, there's so much pressure to recruit at the college level that a lot of your time is spent on the road versus actually coaching and developing the players, you know? So this gives me kind of the best of all worlds. I get, you know, my thumbprint on the thing. Mm -hmm. I get to work the, the guys as much as I want. And the NCAA has so many rules about working with the players. I mean, I get more time to work with these guys, you know? Yeah, so, um, and I like, uh, you know, for the the players or coaches out there, there's a, a I know you like, you're a big fan of uh, reading on sports psychology and things like yeah. that. So the book Mindset that's out uh, by Carol Dweck talks about, the, you know, the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And you know, yeah. I think what you're speaking to is exactly to that point, that if I only look at success in a linear fashion or in terms of position or status, yeah, then I might limit my ability to grow. Sure. Um, so when, but when you look at what you're really passionate or trying to share, which is you know coaching, knowledge, skills, uh, your own experience, or, or you know uh, that when that opportunity comes, right, we don't see it as uh, linear. Yeah. Right? You know, we see it as this is this is the opportunity. It sounds like your your mind was ready for that. Um, did you did you have a good appreciation for the West LA basketball culture? Because it's not a lot of places. I mean, I know AAU is is nationwide, but it seems like a, uh, you know LA is uh, you know a hotbed. A for yeah, <laughs> LA is a monster. I you know honestly, I had recruited LA, I recruited uh, Arizona, I recruited Nevada, I recruited a lot of West Coast from, at the Division One level. So I thought I knew. I had no idea. I really had no idea. Um, I mean, it's such a monster and it's so endless, right? There's so many kids that play basketball in the LA area. I mean, it's unbelievable. So that part took some adjusting, right? And then 
the other thing that I didn't realize is, you know, sometimes, and still to this day, I'm still guilty because I forget how young the guys are because I'm so used to working with guys that are 18 to 24, really. You know, if a guy red shirts or he sits out here, I mean, he's, you know, he's 22 or 20, you know. So that thing was different. So a lot of times I would, I had, I was hyper aware of how much wear and tear these guys with their training that, you know, they train with us and they have a personal trainer. Then they have a shooting coach and they have this. And so I'm always trying to build in like rest days and recovery days and maybe meant, you know, so my first year I was like, hey, we're taking this day out. This day. And then guys would come back the next day and they'd be all banged up. I'd be, what happened? Oh, well, yesterday I was with my trainer. I go, no, with your trainer? You had a day off, you know, but th- again, the pressure, the expectation, the external pressure from whoever is like, no, you got to work, you got to work. No days off, no so, days off. So they don't hear the message. They're hearing a different message. Oh, I think, yeah, especially when you're dealing with younger kids. I mean, they're hearing the message they're hearing, right, is is parent or uncle or AAU coach or trainer who's been working with them since they were a kid. Yeah, or Instagram and, or sure. every AAU and, tournament they go to, somebody's like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm working with r- right. this and, guy, and he helps you get into a D1 school. and Absolutely. And there's certainly value, I and mean, there's a ton of value. I just think... You know, a great article just came out on ESPN, I think it was two weeks ago, about kids are ticking time bombs. And it's because of all the overtraining and overuse, you know. So I've kind of evolved after that year. I was like, okay, i got to step back and really look at this. How can we how can we meet in the middle and how can I make this work? So now if we do a day off, it's a day off, but we're going to do yoga. Or, you know, we're going to do something together um, so that they feel like they're getting better and they're doing something. Are the but, kids and the parents open to it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think they appreciate it, you know. And it's tricky. I I get it. Like, sometimes a kid's trainer's only available on Tuesday night at 9 p.m. And that's the one time they're going to get them. And they got to go and they want to do that. You know, and it's hard. It it, it is challenging to tell them, hey, you shouldn't do that. But especially, like, in the season with, you know, we practice six days a week. We've got night games. We've got tournaments. We go three days in a row. And you just, you know, the mental and physical break they need. They just, you know, I think they need more of those. So, that's been yeah. kind of that was for me the biggest eye opener was like how much they are actually doing. Yeah, and I mean, can't they move towards more restorative work, or is it's like this pressure of like I got to be in the gym? I know, like a, you know, you're fortunate, right? Where it has a weight room, sure, right? So it's like it can, having resources can also then be a challenge of like, well, how do you have them and then know how well, frequency? Well, I think every them. trainer, right? It's like it's their opportunity now to make the kid better on the court, and it's their brand. So they're, they want to get their thumbprint on the player, which means they're going to shoot whatever it is, 150 shots, 300 shots, and we're going to go game speed because they want to, they got to feel like they're making them better, right? And so I think where the gap is is between coach and trainer or coach and high school coach and AU coach or high school coach and private trainer. So work. are we going to see like a Bilicekian uh, position from you <laughs> in the near future? Is that what's going to happen at the, at the no, high school level? You no, know? <laughs> no, I don't think so. But, you know, I think what we try to do the best we can, and I think we've done just an okay job on it, is just kind of partner with everyone and try to just be aligned the best we can. Like, hey, here's what we've done this week. Just be really careful on your workload when you meet with them. You know, and, and that's been good. I think everyone can appreciate what we're trying to do, right? Like we're just trying to, we're trying to help uh, and manage workload. You know, so we've had a good reception so far. It's just it's a lot of extra work on us because then we we're having to reach out. Every we have thirteen kids on our varsity program. Well, those kids all don't have the same trainer, so that's thirteen other additional people potentially you're having to communicate with and get on, you know, get aligned with, and so. Yeah, that, that has its own challenges, but I think for them, we're, we're, we're getting there. We're, you know, we're treading, we're treading water, so we're getting there. It's a lot to control. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. Well, you can put it in the newsletter, maybe. Just send, send everyone, <laughs> send everyone yeah, the same. Yeah, one blast, right? Yeah, exactly. One blast. <laughs> this is our schedule, <laughs> you know. Exactly. Make sure to practice restorative yoga only. Yes. That would be great. That's a good idea. <laughs> I mean... Ideally, if they're the right trainers, then they should be working on recovery. Uh, you know, well, well, when I say trainer too, I'm talking like basketball trainer. Like most of them, you know, they lift with us, and we have strength. You know, so a lot of it's just basketball trainer. So they're specifically either paying or going to see this person to get work on basketball specific skill. That's outside of any physical. Correct, trainer. or or us, you know. So that's where it gets tricky because that's where the trainer wants to. Okay, let me help you with your shot. Let me help you get in shape. You know, and that's where they're trying to get their thumbprint on it. So, 
There's definitely yeah. a way to do it. I just think there's, you know, you got to be a really effective messenger and communicator in order to make it work best for the athlete, you know. So will you approach athletes one-on-one or you just kind of deliver this message as a team to like to, to encourage them to be thinkers for themselves? I mean, cuz like you said there are so many influences and yet Yeah. they are the athlete and it's their bodies. Correct. Yeah, again, tricky. Still trying to navigate through it. I mean, we always talk to them about workload. Try to talk to whoever's kind of in their immediate who's the person that picks them up the most and kind of draw, you know, usually it's a parent, right? They're the ones picking them up and driving them to the next thing. So we just try to remind them and then generally I'll send an email to our parents, you know, every week or so like, hey, we have done a lot this week. This was a heavy week. Please, please keep that in mind, you know, and so, you know, it's hard. I mean, you can't track, you know, it's hard to track, but that's kind of, we're just trying to be proactive on it and see if we can get uh, a better line of communication with trainers and parents on it. it. Yeah. How about, um, you know, because it becomes so focused and pressure filled, how do you keep it fun? You know, especially going into a season like this, the expectations are up. Um, you know, is there availability for that in high school basketball? Or it's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or your job question. is to work, <laughs> right? you know? Like, oh, that's a great yeah. question. So it's funny you, you brought it up. I was talking to a, um alumni, a young alum who played for us uh, my first year, and him and his dad, and we were saying how, like, competitive and cutthroat high school basketball is in Southern California. And I said, yeah. I said, I wonder if there's any enjoyment left. You know, like, is there any enjoyment in this thing anymore, mm-hmm. you know? And we were kind of laughing. And, if, and, and of course, there is. But, um, you know, for us, what we've tried to do with, with some of the things, especially with our culture, is, like, define what these mean to us, right? What does leadership mean? Like, everyone throws the word out there. What does it actually mean? Like, And then what does it mean to us, right? So one of the fun is actually a word we have defined in our culture and basically what it means for us is doing something hard and doing it together. So for us, that's fun because, you know, you tell a kid fun, they go, oh, cool, let's, you know, we're going to dance around here when coach isn't looking, we're going to do this. And you're like, that's not really our idea of fun, right? Right, that's a response to an over-controlled environment. Sure, right. sure. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're trying to do that. Now, we do also reserve time and I'll make sure like in practice or after pra- post-practice, pre-practice where... Uh, I'll tell you know the staff, hey, I want we're gonna play dribble tag, which is like a game you play in camp or for little kids, right? Right, right, right. Just kind of loosen them up and you know, um, and do that kind of thing. So that's kind of we try to build those things in so that it's not always feeling like there's so much stress and pressure and you know the the trying to think about those expectations outside of us, you know. So we do a lot of that, um, which I think has been really helpful. You know, like coachable what does coachable mean coachable means you're you're trying to take the coaching and make the, and make an honest effort to execute it that's it just do that look us in the eye make an honest effort you know um, so we're trying to you know we're trying to get there but I think the enjoyment piece is huge and that's why I'm really big I mean we do a lot we do six days a week we watch film we do scout reports we do walkthroughs on the game day we do a lot you know I mean we're really preparing to play college basketball and so I also understand they're 15 some 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds that want to have some downtime where it's not like so intense. So, you know, we try to keep it loose when we can. And I also want the kids feeling like they can be themselves. We're not walking on eggshells in our program and, you know, doing that kind of thing. Right. Well, what worked for you? I mean, you played at the, at the next level. So how did you, you know, what worked to help you keep focus and keep putting in those long practices and go through all the things you're putting them through? Yeah, you know, for me, the fun part was, I always thought about it like I was always the underdog, right? I was five, well, I used to be 5'10", I swear, but I think I've shrunk (laughs) down to 5'9". So I was always, for me, the fun part was trying to prove everybody wrong. Like, I could do this. I was athletic enough to do this. I could compete with these more athletic guys and guys, you know, guys that were recruited. So for me, that was the fun part, you know? So I had no problem focusing because I was so kind of obsessed with that piece of it that's all I thought about you know so I'd always lift more I'd always try to win every sprint you know that the competitive side of me that's where I focused in on and I enjoyed you know um so I didn't have a problem you know what when it really hit me was at the division one level when you're going from the kids are going from class all day to a three-hour practice to then like a one-hour film session and then a study hall and you put you just start counting the days they're doing that 
And by January, they're mentally and physically, they're just, they've checked out, they're done. You know, and you start thinking about going, gosh, how do we create like just more energy in here and just where they want to come back, you know, where they, they're excited to be here versus mm-hmm. like, all right, we got practice, you know. And, and every basketball player wants to be like, they like playing, right? That's why they do it. But you add on all of that other stuff and it just becomes, it's, it's, it's a, a lot. lot it's a lot of responsibility. It's a lot, you know. So I think we're trying to evolve there too is like, how do we do more stuff off the court as a group? You know, we always try to go to another team's game whether it's baseball football together you know we'll do a couple team building things or we're just you know some constantly kind of searching for more of those to bring them together off court stuff that can help them relax you know yeah can you do some novel environment workouts uh beach or yeah the santa monica stairs here absolutely (laughs) yeah absolutely (laughs) at least you'll have fun watching that yeah a little tan while i'm doing it no no harm in coaches enjoying players working hard yeah, so you mentioned a couple things there that we that we want to cover. So team culture, yep, right, and um, uh, let's see what else. So yeah, how how do you build a team culture when you come in and you and you you took over? It was not the smoothest of times uh, at Winward, right? Correct. Uh, so so how do you embrace that? I mean, that can be intimidating for a lot of coaches mm-hmm. out there uh, to take a position where there's pressure or. Yeah. Um, I mean, was there was there a pressure to continue the culture or to build a new new brand of culture? Uh, I mean, the expectation was to create a culture, right? So when I got there, it was a little turbulent, and it had been turbulent for like the past year, I, I, I think. You know, I just got away. I try to get closure for the guys on that right away. Tell me about your experience up to right now, up to today. Boom, met with every kid in our program. Great, thank you. And then from there I said, okay, how do we smooth out the turbulence? That's all we wanna do. Year one, smooth out the turbulence. How do we do that? Expectations, um, be positive coaches, be tough and demanding. Really keep it that simple. Like, stay within those parameters, I think we'll smooth out the turbulence, right? It helped that we won a couple games. We beat a nationally ranked team, like game, I think it was our third game, we beat a nationally ranked team. Um, in a tournament, which was a huge win, and, and of course no one expected. So all of a sudden, you know, we got momentum, and then and a little bit of confidence, like yeah, oh, we're 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 a winning team again, right? So we kind of just built from there. Okay, what's year two look like? Year two to me look exactly the same. Let's keep being tough, demanding, and positive. Let's make sure we're consistent on our standards. What are our goals? What's our mission? What are our core values? And just adding a few little things. Um, but really, I mean, I think those kind of those pillars are kind of what I've held on to, and what I'll continue to hold on to. You know, and I think the hardest thing is just the consistency, especially at the high school level. You've got kids that, you know, they get sick. They've got I'm going to be late today, coach. I have a, 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 a appointment with my teacher. I can't miss it. You know, so you have a lot of in and outs. And I think where we're at now, which is a great place to be, is our upperclassmen who have been in the program. Now that they know it, they're, it's a trickle-down effect where they're now helping mentor the younger guys in the program and saying, hey, like we don't do that, or here's what we do. You can't do that. If you're late, like one of my pet peeves, and I, we always do a demonstration every year, is if you're late and you walk into the gym, right? So you're late. You're 20 minutes late, and you kind of like slow roll it into the gym, then you tie your shoe. <laughs> so <laughs> we say if you're late, you should be sprinting through the doors, shoes already on, ready to go, and like, coach, I'm late. Sorry. I, how do I get into practice? You know, and so like just little things like that. But again, I think you've got to coach those, and you got to be consistent on those. And sometimes that's hard, right? Like, you know, there's days where like I'm not my best self on the court. Uh, my assistants might miss something. I might miss something, and that that miss could set us back a month, right? Because we missed a kid not touching a line on a, you know, on a, on a 17 or whatever that is, and all of a sudden we let them get away with something, you know. So. Um, just trying to really get more consistent. Well, just trying to keep continue to build consistency on all that stuff, hold them accountable, and and the culture thing. Yeah. So so you talk about leadership. Talk about building a program. How do you help students embrace that leadership role where they wanna they wanna help others toe the line and model the program? Yeah. Well, we're really lucky. We have one student athlete now who's kind of just has a natural leadership gift and um, 
so we just try to kind of help him realize the volume of influence he has because I don't think he knew it. He just did it. How did, how did you observe it? Oh, it's just blatantly obvious. I mean, from, well, he's good, which always helps. He's well liked. And um, he's a great liaison between player and coach. And that's all natural. That's not, you know, manufactured. That's just what he is. You know, I mean, he can honestly almost probably be on our staff and, you know, it wouldn't skip a beat. Like, he's, that's just what it, what it is. And so I think that for me was easy to identify. And that's really helped. And, and actually, I've had like two of those. So when I first got here, I had another kid who was like that. And, you know, it just makes things a lot easier. And then really tr- just honing in on that individual and helping them, hey, look, here's what happened. Or the energy's draining. Instead of me blowing the whistle and yelling to everyone and, try- and making them run, want- take a 30 second huddle. See if you can f- fire them up today. And so I think through that, you know, those messages and then giving them ownership in that, right? So if we do that, then the other end, I've got to take his feedback too sometimes where it's like, coach, we're exhausted. We need to do, can we do this? So instead of being like, well, no, we need to, no, we need to do my way. Okay. So, where, so, so where did you learn that skill? Because that's not something, right? The old school coaching is, you know, coach is right and you don't, <laughs> you know, you don't talk back to the coach and yep. don't. I mean, I don't know. I just think it's adapt or die. Like, I think old school, that kind of way of coaching, the authoritative thing is like, it's, I think there's people that still do it. I think it's dead. You know, I just think you got to adapt. I think it's, you got to give the athletes ownership. You got to give them a voice. Do you have to agree with them on everything? No, and vice versa. But I think just the giving them that ownership and then validating that at times, I think it goes, it goes miles, you know, I mean, and it, it lets them know like, hey, he really, he really wants what's best for us, right? Because there are days when they're like, you can tell they're mentally and physically gassed. Some days you got to push through those. Some days, you're, hey, you know what? Now, everyone, let's go in the classroom. All of a sudden we have pizza ready and a movie. You know, and things like that, I think, just go a long, long way for these guys. And, and again, with the stress of academics, being at a high level athletic and academic school, all that stuff, you know, just those little small victories go a long way. Yeah, and, and of course, along with that, uh, you know, I don't know if you've shared some articles or, but the right levels of anxiety or, or, or depression don't show up the same way as they would in an adult. Right. When you're under that much pressure and you don't feel you have any way to slow it down, uh, it can show up in the grades. It yeah. can show up uh, in their attitude or talking back to you, and they're hoping you notice. So it's it's amazing you have a, a staff where different people are looking at different things. Yeah, and and you're paying attention to, uh, yeah. Can we can we dial it up and can we dial it back? Right, right, absolutely. Because <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, and it's it gets tricky too, right? There's some days we're going so hard, and maybe one kid needs that, the dial back piece. Right. But obviously, just you know, social pressure, you know, peers. I mean, all of a sudden you go, hey, maybe we should pull this kid out. What does that tell the rest of the team? How does that make him? You know, there's all these little inner dynamics that like can be hard to manage, and uh, and I sometimes honestly, I mean, I don't know that it's even a conscious thing. I, I'll just go up to him and go, "Hey, are you okay? Are you good?" And I'll let the kid tell me if he's if he's truly not. Generally, he'll say, "I can't do this." All right, let's go to the trainer and see what we can do. You know, but a lot of times, no, I'm good. I'm just, I'll get, I'll push through. Okay. You know? Is there space for players to come talk to you in the locker room? Do you still get that, like, people coming to you with what's going on off the court? Um, right? How much of your job is is also being, uh, you know, another <laughs> yeah. Uncle yeah. Colin? Well, that's kind of the fun part, too, right? It's, it's like hearing, hearing what's going on with these guys off the court. Sometimes it's too much info, but you know, for the most part, it's good. But, again, I think that's where, you know, being the, just having the head coach title – puts you, you know, there's some separation right away, right? Um, whereas my assistants, uh, who are really good with the guys and connect and are, and are young, um, you know, I think they take on the bulk of that. Whereas if there's something that they're like, hey, this is a little bit bigger, or we need, I need to address yeah. this with the coach, a lot of times it's, they'll get some feedback, they'll share with me, and I'll go, great, did you, how'd you handle it? Great, we're good. Or, hey, maybe go back to them and, you know, mention this. And, you know, and so just kind of a little bit of a buffer there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not like I wouldn't, I mean, I'd love to help every situation I could. It's just, you know, a lot of moving parts and and time and and all that stuff. So, 
Um, you know, when I was coached junior college, we had a thing we called five minutes. And it was you had to get five minutes with the head coach once a week. But the rule was you couldn't talk about basketball. So, which made a lot of those guys uncomfortable. Like, oh, what are we going to talk about, you know? But, <laughs> this is um, a test. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was really good. And then, so I try to kind of carry that up to the Division One level where I would walk a different kid to class once a week. Because on those college campuses, it's, you know, it could be a 10, 15-minute walk. And through that time, you could get great info and just check in and get, you know, get get a pulse on the kid. See who he's hanging on. out with. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, when we were, that walk is like 10 seconds, you know, small campus. <laughs> you say hello, oh, here's your classroom, I gotta go. But, uh, stand but that's on, the Stand idea. with them in the lunch line yeah, yeah, on Taco exactly. Tuesday. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, so, but that, that is the fun part is when the kid, you know, when, I think in, a lot of that's trust, right? They gotta trust that they can come to you, that you will keep it to yourself and you will give honest feedback. And I think that's been another thing for us is like, I think the players, you know, the players know that we're always available for them, whether it's, you know, phone, uh, text, they can always come in the office and if there are issues, they can certainly bring them to us and we'll do the best we can to, you know, that, that is one of the biggest things why we do the job. We want to compete, but we, you know, we want to be there and help kids and help develop, you know, the whole, the whole athlete, not just, you know, the performance side. And that's got to come from the athletic director on down. Right? Yeah. It's gotta... Which it does, which is the best part about working at yeah, Winward. Yeah. So um, what's something that your players don't know about you? What's one uh, thing you're reading right now or one uh, mm. hobby you do away from basketball? Uh, that's a great question. I don't, you know, um, let's see. One thing I'm reading, I just finished um, The One Thing. Gary Gary Keller, real estate mogul. Okay. Um, Side career, perhaps. Really good book. <laughs> yeah, maybe right. It's if I can last at Windward, you know. Um, really good book. Basically, just a, a good like reminder on don't get caught up in trying to do everything. Average, you know, pick one or two things and really dial in on that. So like we were talking about culture, like there's so much stuff you can do. But if you do too much of it, it becomes diluted, and then like you, you know, you didn't really improve any of it. You just right. kind of stayed idle. Versus like pick two things, or if in his case, like one thing, as the book is titled, and really attack that. What was his one thing? His was so he had grown the the real estate his real estate company, had a lot of success, and then it took a big dip. And it wasn't because of the market; it was because he was growing and he got away from the hiring process. So he kind of got away from like what was getting him there, and that was the actual people, right? And so then he realized he had to get involved back into the hiring process and really focus on who he's bringing in versus like how many and what, which I thought was phenomenal, right? It's the same thing. Like, we don't, I don't need 10 coaches. We need three, four of the right coaches, you know, and just the right kind of people with the right character. And same even in players, if you're recruiting at the college level, like, you know, you just really need the right people on board, you know. So that was, it was a great reminder on that end. Um, so that's one book I've read. What's the one thing these guys don't know about me? I don't know. You know, I think they know a lot. Sometimes I share, sometimes I share too much too. They probably don't know I used to play piano until I was 16. But I've lost it all, so don't try, to, don't to, try to get me back on the keys. Did you have to give it up for basketball too? No, you know, when I was that age, my mom made us play an instrument until we were, 16 of course my you know your mom makes you it's like i don't want to do this but now i'm like oh i, I wish i kept that could, thing going yeah. yeah you know so uh, same thing my sister I, I played basketball my sister kept playing piano and now she's like you know puts can dazzle people to right sleep and right stuff. absolutely yeah, i wish i had that still but yeah so piano days are over though <laughs> takes a lot of practice and commitment yeah i don't have the time now <laughs> as well yeah and so do you encourage these guys I mean is there time for family time do you encourage them to find some balance or is it just not possible with this level of commitment no I no I certainly encourage it I think it's absolutely possible that's the nice thing about high schools again I, you know for us and you know other schools do it different other schools will go like oh, darn near all year round like the only rule in CIF where we are which is incredible you only have to take 21 days off in a row, one time. So that's twenty-one days off in a row. It's, you know, it's three weeks. That's the only rule. Is that usually in falls? terms of practice time? Yeah. So that usually falls in the summer. Yeah. So like for us, it's we've already we already did it. So we could technically we could practice tomorrow, 
you know, I mean, but you know, for me, again, I, I, what I'm trying to do with all my experiences, like, what did I love from my West Valley College experience? What did I not like? What did I love about my Fullerton experience and not like? What you know, Portland and so on, and then go and try to implement all the stuff I loved about it into this program, and all the stuff I didn't love about it out. And one of those things was balance. And so for us, like, I tell the guys, hey, in August and July, gym's open from, you know, 10 to 2. I'll be there. Assistants will be there. If you want to come in, great. If not, see you next time. You know, and guys come in or they don't, and that's fine. You know, but to give them that choice, give them that freedom. And again, when they come back, when we come back to school, <clears throat> they are excited to practice. They're not worn out. They haven't heard my voice every day, you know, in the summer. And so, like, there's an excitement and there's an enthusiasm, which also gives, fires up the coaches again. And I think for the coaches, too, it's like, <clears throat> I got a chance to read a book. I got a chance to listen to a bunch of podcasts about being a better coach and a leader and husband and dad, you know. So it gives us time to kind of hit the, hit the refresh button, you know. Right. And I think, <clears throat> and again, I don't know what other high school programs do. I think some probably, you know, crank it up in the summer. Some dial it back, just depending on who you are. And I've tried to kind of really strike a balance of like, hey, we, you guys spend time with your family, spend time with your friends, do whatever it is you guys do now, at the beach and you know, at your buddy's house, and then come back just and we'll get after it again. Yeah, I think that's a, a key perspective. You know, the ability to have choice, even though you're committed to something, you yeah. have to choose it, right? right? Even as a professional, every time you choose to come in or look forward to your practice or look forward to the next season. Right. Um, you get to redefine who you are totally. as an athlete and as a team. So, right, anytime you feel like you've lost that Absolutely. freedom. Um, when well, I think at the college level, you, you can because of the time, the commitment, the long days, the schedule. I mean, you know, I would guess there's <clears throat> probably one, by the, guy, by the time guys are juniors <clears throat> and they've been through that process for those first two or three years, there is some burnout and some, you know, mental fatigue and physical fatigue and lack of excitement, you know, with summer school, you know, you have summer school and like, you know, just the breaks are so, so few and far between. Do you think adjustments are being made on the, on the D1 level or? No. Or is it, no. no? No, because at that level there's too much pressure to win because it's your job, right? So if you don't win, I mean, if you, I just think guys are too paranoid, like, oh, well, I can't give more time off. We need to be in the gym more. And they have more strict rules about time. So you can't, like, go, you know what I mean? And, and especially in the summer, it's not like it's it's no holds barred where they can just practice four hours a day. They have, like, I think the new rule is I think they have up to four hours a week now in the summer. So it's not that much time for them. It's Collegiate just, at the collegiate yeah, level? Yeah, it's one level, yeah. And it might be more than that. It might be six at this point. I can't remember. but um, So, like, they are limited in the summer. Um, but in the fall, you know, it's... That thing cranks up to a whole new level. So, before we have to wrap up here in a few minutes, so if we're to ask your players at the end of the season about you as a coach, what would what would you like them to say? Mm. Uh, I would, you know, that's a good question. I think I'd like for them to say positive, tough, and fun. The way, the, the way that we define fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I like the way you said it. It was clear. It's like the same discussion I have in my, like, you know, adult men's league. And guys are yelling at like, we want it to be fun. Yeah. And like, well, well, fun means that we all know what we're doing together. Right, right. right. <laughs> but you don't let me get run over. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? So I, I think it's great that you have, that they get to participate in the definition of what the term means. Yeah. Um, but, but enjoyment is a part of it. Huge. I mean, you know, how can you be motivated to continue to give more to something at that commitment level right. if you're not enjoying it? Uh, I have no idea. I've not never, without long-term damage, right? Yeah. People can do it, but they, they're they suffering. When uh, I was 21, I was a manager of a restaurant. Actually, the guys don't know that about me. Okay. When I was 21, I was playing Juco basketball, and I, I was a manager of a restaurant. And I hated it. Like, I hated it. You know, I was like, if I have to do this the rest of my life, you know what I'm saying? And I was like, oh, God, there's no chance. I got no chance, you know? But that experience showed you, like, find something oh, you love or do more. Yes. Well, I always knew I wanted to coach. It was just how do I get there? How do I make enough money to do it and live? You know, and that's where when you start climbing up that coaching ladder and the money starts, 
after your you know fortune experience, which was no money, lost money really, um, start making the thing like a real living, you know. But I'll I'll never forget that like, man, I I can't do this. I hate this. I had to put on slacks, and, you know, walk around the tables. Oh. But it still puts you in the position where you mm-hmm. took that job for no money that to do the thing you yeah. love. I mean, that's yeah. that's really the something I try and convey to athletes. Or, you know, thankful if we're in West LA at a private school, maybe it's not so much a struggle. But if you do the thing you love, money will flow from it. And um, you know, just like my my dear friend over in the Phoenix Suns, he traveled to uh, become the producer for the Suns. I think five dollars an hour, and now he's there. You know, twenty years later, yeah. you know. Uh, cool. running the whole show so um thank you again mark goldberg so uh they're showing us the signs they're gonna okay. have to uh cut in a minute here but parting thoughts ways for people to reach you uh and stay connected to yeah Coach sure Foff. yeah uh, i mean uh social media is uh at colin Foff. good luck spelling Foff if you don't know but it's uh it's p like paul f like frank a f f frank frank that's on twitter um <clears throat> yeah i'd love to connect talk hoops and you know Trying to stay connected and build some new relationships with everybody. Yeah, and can they look for you in the future with uh, Team USA, perhaps? You know, I, hopefully that'd be great. Um, there's that's such a hot entity to try to break into, you know, which is presents its own challenges. But uh, yeah, that would be that's kind of a, another. Uh, no, uh, external goal for me. Uh, yeah. In the meantime, come out and check out a Windward. Yeah. Basketball Free game. Admission. Really? Free admission, yeah. Wow. You can't beat that? No charge for concessions either? No charge for concessions. <laughs> well, I'm going to that for you. <laughs> well, it's, it's a real um, pleasure to hear of your journey, and, um, and thank you for sharing that with the athletes out there, with the coaches out there. Uh, as always, if you uh, have a story to share, if you have a passion for something that you want to share with young athletes or performers, please bring them to us. Reach out to me via Instagram at Richard Listens. Uh, if there's things you'd like to hear from Coach Foff or questions you have, direct them our way, and we'll see if in his time he uh, can answer. If you want to learn some practical tips too, what you can do to get your game to the next level or stay focused on your breaks or ways that you can dial it back if need be if you're someone who's always running a little bit hot so uh thank you again everyone for tuning in uh we appreciate again we'll be back uh, in a week monday 7 p.m live on facebook uh, live and you can get this stream later on if you want to share it with your friends family members and assistant coaches on itunes and spotify within 24 hours and there'll also be a link up on youtube under richard listens take care everybody thanks again to coach foff and the Windward staff. Yeah, thank you. Take care, and we're out.